There's been a lot more talk of recession. Again, I've seen it more in the UK press recently because I've been back in the UK. Um, the as I understand it, the definition of a, a recession is, is it two quarters of negative growth or is it two months? I can't remember. There are a couple different definitions. Yeah. One of them is two negative quarters. Yeah. Another one is generally just a contraction in economic activity over a prolonged period of time. So um, there's different organizations in different areas that are kind of responsible for like calling a recession. The thing is they don't call it till hindsight. Mm -hmm. right? They don't say, okay, we're entering a recession in real time. Uh, often they'll, you know, months later, They'll go back and say, oh, that's when the recession started, right? And right. so generally the, the, the two quarters is like the, the one that's referenced the most, but there's no, there's no you know, official global definition of a recession. But generally speaking, it, yeah. it is a drop on economic output. And we see that with uh, the UK. We have a real cost of living crisis at the moment. I think 20% of the population is in fuel poverty, which means they cannot afford to pay their fuel bills. Um, we know there's a, a massive increase in costs in shopping. I mean, uh, I saw one thing that the, the budget pastors are now up 50% in price. But there's a massive increase, 10 15% on, on a wide range of things that's really hurting people's ability to feed their children. We see stories of families skipping meals. There's all these different stories of things that people are doing. Even the radio shows or the TV shows and newspapers are running articles about how to survive a cost of living crisis, how to manage your budget. But this cost of living crisis, I guess, the, the impact of this is people have less money to spend on other things. So there will be a downstream effect on maybe retail environments or people going to concerts or all these things, which this is what leads to a recession. Yeah, well, there's multiple ways you can get to a recession. Yeah. And one of them is certainly when energy and commodity prices take up a increasing proportion of the economy. Because yeah. basically mandatory spending pushes away, as you described, discretionary, uh, discretionary spending. And so, you know, humans are, are happier and more flourishing when you have to spend very little amount of your money on, you know, the necessities of life and you can spend more on your uh, on travel and, and luxuries and optionality. Uh, but when those necessities increase in cost um, for one reason or another, uh, that, that is a common trigger for a recession. Another one is the, is the, the, the central banks and the fiscal force are trying to push back on inflation, as I described. They can't just create more oil fields, um, but so what they can try to do is reduce demand for things. So they can kind of, in their vision, the best is to have like a very mild recession, um, but it's, you know, they call it a, a soft landing. How do, how do they do that though? Well, historically they don't, right? It's one of those things they always want a soft landing and then they don't get a soft landing and then they get a hard landing and then they have to reverse course. It's, it's very unusual it's rather unusual to get a soft landing. I mean, technically, for example, in the in the 2000s, after the dot-com bubble, uh, in the U.S. at least, you had a relatively soft recession. It wasn't a particularly severe one, but that was a very different cause. Hmm. Um, and so y there are recessions that are worse than others. So they're not delusional in thinking that, you, you know, it, not everything is like a, a giant crisis, but, you know, it's one of those things where, like, analyst Luke Groman would say, we no longer have a dial, we have like an off and on switch, and they still think it's a dial. And, but because there's so much debt in the system, you know, that dial starts to become like a switch. It's either you're either growing or you're, or you're kind of collapsing because there's just so much debt that if you're not growing, you're, you know, you're falling apart pretty quickly. But how do they centrally drive a reduction in demand? So one thing that they can do is they can tighten monetary policy to make it harder to get a loan. Oh, okay. So they can, they can slow down housing activity. Uh, and that, that's, that's a big factor for a lot of economies. Um, and then especially like junk debt has harder getting financing. Uh, and then they can also combine that with the, the fiscal side can stop doing stimulus, things like that. They could raise taxes, which they're not doing because that's politically unpopular, but they, when they're not sending out stimulus checks, many cases right now. Well, they're talking about that in the UK in one way. So the, uh, the energy uh, bills, is uh, we talked about this previously. Um, I saw a massive increase, like a nearly 300% increase in my energy bills. Um, and, you know, it's a material difference. You know, you, you see it in, in the bills and you see, and, and you, you know, extrapolate that out for the year and realize how much you're going to spend on gas and electric. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be able to cover that, but I know there's other people who are less fortunate. And so the government recently, Danny, can you just double check this? But I think they're talking about sending out... I think it's in the checks out there that everybody in the country they're going to offer something like 400 pounds 
uh, off the energy bills in October or some, something like yeah, that. Yeah, 400 pounds, uh, 400 pound energy bill discount in October. Yeah, so I was trying to work this out in my head because it says every household in the, is it every household in the country? Every household, yeah. So I was thinking, well, first of all, I don't need this. So why, why do this? And maybe half the country doesn't need this. But is the cost of trying to means test it too expensive? Well, it also says that people on benefits get an additional £650. Okay. But there's those on benefits, and, and it depends which benefits I guess they're on. But what I'm saying is I do not need this, and I know a lot of people who don't need this. So what that means is they could for... Uh, two, they have two other options. They could, for some people, maybe do it for two months, or for some, uh, or just the cost of doing this is lower to the government. There's another point I'm going to come to on windfall taxes. But... Um, so I was trying to think about it like that, and I was also trying to think, well, why £400 discount in October? Because really, most people, it's about £100 a month might make that big difference if they're controlling it. Why, why just do it as a lump in one month? Is it because it's getting colder, so energy prices will go up? Yeah, but I don't think some people's bills are going, energy bills are going to go up £400. Mm-hmm. But even if it is, what about October? Uh, sorry, what about November? What about December? What about January? What about February? They're all cold months in the UK, every single one of them. So I didn't understand one month. Does it say how much the cost it is there? For the entire yeah. program? Yeah. I'll have a look. I mean, this is, this is a, essentially a stimulus check of sorts. Broadly speaking, I think we're going to see that quite a bit this decade. Right. We've already seen it, as you point out, in Europe and some places. Um, and I think we're going to see it more broadly where the stimulus checks we saw before were like these broad ones. Where you could you could take your your check and buy Dogecoin with it. Yeah. I don't recommend, but people did, right? And I think the types of stimulus we're going to see going forward is um, energy and food subsidies, um, and so that that can uh, alleviate the hardship for for uh, the people that need it the most. Um, but it also does contribute to ongoing stagflation and currency devaluation, right? So the, at the end of the day, the the key thing they have to do is figure out how to get more energy and more commodities supply to come online. And these other temps, I think because of how much debt's in the system, they can't, they basically just can't let just recessions happen for a prolonged period of time. Mm. Like if you look at every recession, there's always these stimulus effects. And that's, and then, you know, in a, in a healthy environment, like let's say you had a low debt system, recessions can just kind of work themselves out. Right, you, just, you eventually clear out the malinvestment, and then the cycle starts anew with, with cap. You know, enterprising individuals come in with their capital, and they kickstart the next investment cycle and the next consumption cycle. But because there's so much debt in the system, it's like the way I would describe it is like if you have this metic- like a uh, meticulously garden that you like you you you've elaborately uh, like designed. If you let that go, it starts to unravel pretty quickly. It's not just like a healthy, balanced forest, for example. Sounds like and, my garden. And so, so our our economy is like this meticulous garden that if they stop interfering with it, it starts to get messy pretty quickly. And so I think we're going to see we're going to see some level of economic deceleration or outright recessions, and then we're probably going to see some increasing usage of these kind of targeted stimulus uh, for for kind of man- things that people have no choice but to, to spend on. And then how is that financed? If it's financed by printing more money, we increase the money supply, yeah. which drives inflation, which yes. which you know, feels to me like yeah. its own kind of death spiral. But did they, they're talking about financing it through a windfall tax on the energy companies, right? Yes. Now, and I think they talked about raising like 15 billion for this, but, but windfall taxes themselves, to me, they seem a little bit targeted, arbitrary, and... In a free market unfair, the the politicians' rhetoric is, well, we're in, we have an energy crisis, but these uh, uh, oil and gas companies are making record profits. Um, what, what does it say? Uh, oil and gas firms will be hit with a twenty five percent windfall tax. Yeah, but what is like the historical background to windfall taxes? And and it to me it just seems is that I guess politically popular because it's just targeting a group that is demonized but what is the impact on the companies themselves is it just okay we make 25 percent less profit this year well so ge- the history of it is generally that whenever the state needs funds especially more so than other times uh they will go after demonized groups okay to, to try to get them um the challenge here is that uh 
energy companies made very little money the past decade, mm-hmm. um, especially the past five years. Uh, let's use North America uh, shale, for example. Um, most of them were free cash flow negative during that period. They basically were, were, were producing, they were investing a lot and not making money for it. Now, we didn't do reverse windfall taxes. We didn't give them money. <laughs> yeah, of course. But now, due to like this, the opposite happening, they said, okay, we're going to stop doing that. We're going to stop plowing money into unprofitable projects. Uh, or we're going to be more capital disciplined. That's what our shareholders want. And so you get this spike in profitability. But that comes after a long stretch of unusually low profitability. And if you look at, say, stock indices, energy companies have been utterly terrible performers over, say, a 10-year period compared to broad equity indices. And now they're finally getting the spike. And then you come in and say, well, now you're the ones benefiting this. We're going to we're gonna take that away. And take your money. And you know, so in the in the near term, you say, okay, it makes sense. So you take the chunk of that, you give it to people. The the challenge is the downstream effects is does that affect that company's decision to invest in more energy uh, in your jurisdiction? Do they do they want to bring more energy to market, or you know, do they want to maybe not put a lot of new capital in that industry because they they say, okay, it's kind of like how if you, if there's say there's two developing countries, one of them is is known for respecting property rights. And one of them, every 10 years, has a revolution and they take all the assets. Okay. If you're a foreign entity, then you have capital and you have expertise and you want to go, say, develop an oil field. You're going to pick the the one that you have a high probability assessment that they're going to respect, that you own the assets and Mm -hmm. you can profit from them. You're not going to put it in the one where you don't know the future of those assets. And so, for example, if there's like this tendency towards windfall taxes, the risk is that a company might say, well, if this is going to keep happening, maybe we should just not really keep investing in the energy space. Maybe we should go elsewhere. Maybe investors will say, even though a company might want to keep investing in the energy space, that's what they do. Outside investors might say, I'm not going to keep investing there because it's just going to keep getting windfalled. So I'll, I'll invest elsewhere. And so some of these things can be potentially short-sighted. With the ultimate goal in the long run, the, the thing that actually fixes this is to bring more uh, supply online and ideally, the, the cleanest and longest, longest lasting. So, you know, there's the, in the near term, you just need more supply. Long term, you want the cleanest, best supply to come online. Um, and of course, there's, there's always efficiencies you can do. You can incentivize people to make their homes more energy efficient. Mm-hmm. Um, there, there's ways to reduce kind of arbitrary energy loss. None of these things we've talked about seem to be solving the problem of the amount of debt in the system. Um, Historically, with the um, I've watched the Ray Dalio video on the short and long-term debt cycle. Historically, how does how does the debt get removed from the system in the long-term debt cycle? Is there like debt jubilees? Is there defaults? How does that tend to happen? So historically, when debt as as a share of the economy is this big, it defaults in one way or another. Right. It could be outright defaults, and that's common. For example, in a developed country where they owe dollars, they can't print dollars, and they just say we're we can't we can't pay the debts. So, so that's probably what will happen in Sri Lanka. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then in developing countries, it's it generally happens instead through inflation, where they say... Developed. Developed countries. Yeah, yes. sorry, I thought you said developed. Oh, developed countries. Yeah. Uh, where they say, okay, we can, we're can we going to pay the debt we you know because the, 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 it's denominated in a currency we can print. So we're not going to default. Um, but we're just going to print a lot of money and we're going to pay those debts. So you're going to get every dollar or every euro or every pound you're owed yeah, it's just going to be worth. It's just going to be worth, you know, <laughs> maybe half as much as it was yeah. when you bought that security. Uh, and so that that's, I think, what we're going to see is that inflation is going to be higher than interest rates on average for a prolonged period of time. Now, you could get a deflationary shock like you had in 2020. You can get these brief moments where that's not true. But I think in general, you know, we've already been in a period where inflation is above interest rates. And I think that's going to continue for, for quite a while. And, and what are you predicting with interest rates? I know that's difficult, but... Uh, the UK, where what was it, nine percent? It's predicted to go up to ten percent. The US is eight point three, I think. Eurozone was eight point one today, I think. I mean, they're all around about that. Uh, do you think these will settle down at like five, six percent? Do you think we could go up to twelve to fifteen? I know there's real world figures, but we can only really benchmark what we actually know. Um, uh, do you think we could stay around eight percent, and it could be for years, like? This partially depends on human decisions, which is what makes it challenging, right? Okay. So that giving an answer to that partially depends on what is Putin going to do? Yes. What's Europe going to do in response to Putin? What's the U.S. going to do? Um, so in general, 
I think we're, say, in the U.S., potentially reaching a, a plateau for a period of time where due to base effects, you can kind of level off a little bit. But I think the underlying problem is still unresolved, that there's just not enough energy and certain commodities available. Uh, and, and Europe's got it the worst, but it's, it's, it's global because commodities are a global market. Um, and so my expectation is that if you look back at the 40s and the 70s, you had very high inflation, but it wasn't a straight line. You had periods of, of pushback. Okay. Uh, and so I think right now we're kind of in a period of pushback. Um, and it's, it's, it's challenging to say how successful it's going to be because part depends on understanding the breaking point when people riot, understanding, you know, is it going to be any sort of de-escalation in, in, in this war or no? Um, so those are variables that can, that can influence it. So in general, I am positioned towards uh, an inflationary outcome without trying to predict exactly what level inflation is going to be, especially because, as you pointed out, there's, there's real numbers. You know, it, it's, it's, it, there's different pockets of inflation. So I think that looking back at the end of this decade, energy prices are going to be much higher in dollar, euro, pound, yen terms than they are right now. But I think it's not going to be a straight line. And I think it, it was uh, a few shows ago you said to me, you think the story of the next decade is inflation. So it's clearly not going to be a short-term uh, solution. But uh, I assume at some point when things start to level off, it will become a good time to start investing in certain areas. Like you as an investor, you know, what kind of time horizon, what kind of things are you looking at? It's important to have some dry powder ready. Yeah, so, I, so I'm rather defensive as central banks are trying to push back a little bit. They're trying to suck liquidity out of the mm -hmm. market. But I'm still, the majority of my assets are in these long-term hard assets. You know, things like energy producers, pipelines, profitable companies producing real things, Bitcoin, some gold, uh, you know, different types of commodity exposures, basically real-world exposures, real estate. Um, uh, and so basically my approach is to have this kind of diversified set of real assets as well as some cash for liquidity to rebalance into any sort of you know liquidity shocks we get, things like that, kind of kind of take advantage of that counter cyclical approach. Uh, so when people buy high and, and and sell low, I try to just tweak it a little bit and do the opposite. But I'm not like making, I'm not I'm not actively trading the market too aggressively. Just kind of a small dial that I kind of lean in when things get a little cheaper, and I kind of back off a little bit when things get a little bit euphoric. But but those hard assets, property, gold, Bitcoin, but also energy companies, because I think uh, based on everything you said, um, you're assuming there's going to be some significant investment in energy production somewhere. We're seeing it. We're seeing it to some extent. I mean, okay. we're seeing we're seeing more interest in the space. But I think I think a lot of the market is still thinking this is transitory, hmm. and they're also concerned about about you know the the what percent of the profits they'll be able to keep and things like that. And so we're not seeing this massive ramp up in CapEx. We are seeing an interest in CapEx. And then ironically, some of the supply chain things can feed into that. I mean, some of the materials they need to do energy CapEx are actually held up from logistics problems, right? So it kind of all ties into each other. But I think that this is a, a multi-year process to realign supply chains to some extent, as well as bring more and, and, and more types of energy to market. I think this is a... It, generally, it, so historically, these commodity cycles are these five to 10 year cycles. I mean, they, they take quite a bit of time and capital to ramp up. Um, and I don't really see this one being any different. And I'm kind of monitoring as we're seeing high energy prices, I'm seeing is, is tons of more CapEx flooding into the market? Not really. We're seeing an uptick, but we're not, we're at no, kind of in no way of measuring. Are we seeing like a massive glut of oil coming anytime soon? And what about what's happening with rates? Because I know it's uh, very difficult for the central banks to raise rates at the moment. But at some point, uh, with regards to curbing inflation, you know that that is one of the weapons they have. I think rates went up slightly in the UK again recently. Uh, do you think there's a chance that rates will go up significantly, or do you just think it's just not palatable? So I think that they're going to try to raise rates until something breaks. Okay. Right? So in the 70s, they were able to raise rates because debt as a percentage of GDP was low. Okay. You could put rates into double digits, and that interest expense was still relatively small. I mean, it, it put the economies into a recession, but it didn't put you into a depression. Okay. Whereas in the 40s, when you have sovereign debt's 100% debt to GDP, and it's even worse now because you have all this private debt, you know, if, if mortgage rates are 10, 50 percent, if if treasury debt is is you know 10, 50 percent, everything everybody's insolvent, everybody's insolvent, mm -hmm. and so I don't think they're going to be able to get to positive real rates, meaning rates that are higher than inflation levels. 
they're certainly trying to uptick them. Uh, but of course, they're doing it rather slowly. I mean, we're sitting here with, as you said, like 8% inflation. And they're like, okay, 50 basis points here, 50 basis points here, which is funny because that's actually the fastest they've done it in, in 20 years. You know, in the U.S., we, we haven't had 50 basis point hikes for like 20 years. Um, but it's it's also woefully in, insufficient. And so I don't think, basically, I think that I, regardless of what they do with rates, that's not what solves this. What solves this is bringing more energy abundance and commodity abundance to markets. Uh, and in the meantime, I think they're going to try to protect their currencies until you start to get outright recession or you get um, credit market freeze or you get sovereign bond markets get illiquid and messy, right? So in, in the United States, that could mean that, you know, whenever you see the, the dollar gets too strong, foreign sector doesn't buy a lot of treasuries, banks already are stuffed full of treasuries, who's the marginal buyer of treasuries? Uh, so you get less liquidity in the market, it gets messier. And then as I said with Europe, I mean, who, who wants to buy Italian sovereign debt? Right Not now. me. Who wants to buy that and hold that for 10 years? <laughs> uh, and so yeah. who wants to buy Japanese government bonds at 0.25% for 10 years when they have 200 some percent debt to GDP? 